Greetings, scholars. Uh, hope you're well. Um, this uh, lecture will uh, cover chapter one, um, the evolution of psychology. Uh, so what we'll do, we'll start with um, the uh, original schools of thought, um, the perspectives that founded the, uh, the psychology um, field of study. And then we'll move into uh, some of the more modern uh, psychological schools of thought. Uh, and perspectives, okay? So what we'll do, um, we'll start at the beginning and then we'll work our way um, to current day. Uh, and uh, as, a, as a psychologist, this is always a great thing to look at kind of where you come from and then um, where you're going. So uh, it'll be a good background for, for those who are not psychology majors and give you an idea of um, the science of psychology, why uh, psychology is considered a STEM field or a science uh, because we do um, perform scientific uh, experiments um, to answer questions about the human experience, uh, the human brain, um, behavior, and um, the way we analyze things with our minds. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and then we'll get started. All right, so again, the evolution of psychology is chapter one, and uh, we'll move on um, after we're done with this one. So again, um, we'll be covering several things over the course of the semester. This is just the foundation of uh, what we'll cover um, for, uh, for general site. Okay. All right. So the history, I'm going to start at the very beginning, uh, kind of, kind of the founding of, uh, of psychology. We'll talk about, you know, how, how it came about, um, how psychology was formed, how it was founded. And, uh, and now kind of what we, what we use that foundation for. Okay. So, at the very beginning, um, there was a um, there was a breaking away of um, different fields. Okay, so originally psychology was was thought to be a mixture or a combination of uh, philosophy and physiology. Right, the philosophy part is uh, just trying to find out you know how uh, the world around us works. And then the physiology part is, you know, the body, the brain, all those different things um, that we experience. OK, so uh, we'll deal with them. Um, this gentleman here, uh, let me get my um, pointer so you'll see. I'll start pointing. Let's do this. If I can find it. Let's see if I can find it. Let's not let me find it. Okay, so there is a there was a there was a change, right? There was a change in um, the schools of thought, right? So we started off as kind of a combination of uh, physiology and philosophy, and uh, Wilhelm Wundt, uh, where my cursor is, this gentleman here, uh, he's a German um, physician, psychologist, researcher, and he decided that psychology should break away from uh, philosophy and physiology. And he created um, as um, what we know now, now know as psychology, okay? Um, there were several, there were two original schools of thought. And the very first school of thought uh, when we talked about and referred to psychology was structuralism, okay? And structuralism was a school of thought that dealt with um, how our consciousness is broken down into separate and independent elements and parts, okay? And so that was the premise for structuralism. Um, 
and investigated how these elements were related and worked together as a unit, right? So Edward Titchener was an Englishman and he immigrated to the United States. And so that's how psychology of the beginnings of psychology came to the United States, okay? But Wilhelm Bott was the gentleman in Germany, in Europe, who again founded and is considered the father, we'll talk about that, the father of psychology. And Edward Titchener was a student. Yeah, he was a student of Wilhelm Wundt and he took that information. He took those premise, he took the premise of psychology, he took structuralism and he again immigrated to the United States. And now that's why we have the, United, the, the psychology in the United States, okay? Um, so we talked about the components, right? Just like um, we talk about the components of a classroom, right? So structuralism is looking at the individual components and how those individual components make up the whole sum of what we're wanting to study, right? So a classroom, when we think about a classroom, we're thinking about desks, we're taking, thinking about whiteboards, uh, maybe a projector or a screen. Uh, you have students, you have a professor. All of those are different components that make up um, the classroom. And so that's how structuralism was founded. We're looking at those individual components, um, specifically sensation, perception, feelings, and the images of our conscious experience. So we're looking at the conscious experience of an individual. Consciousness was the premise, right? Um, the one way that we were able to examine the contents of one's consciousness is to ask them what they're feeling, right? To ask them how they're feeling what they're thinking, what kind of sensations were they having, right? And so that introspection was the way that we did that. The, the downside to introspection, however, is it's very subjective. Everyone has a very different outlook on life and their, their introspection will be very, very different. So it's very, very, it's not as objective as one would think. They had to train individuals um, and they trained individuals to, to practice introspection, right? So they would train them for several weeks, several months, and then they would present them with different stimulus or stimuli, and then they would ask them, okay, how do you feel? What is the sensation you feel, right? How do you feel during this circumstance or this situation, right? And again, that's different for everyone, right? So you might train 100 people but if I put 100 people in a room and I presented them with a, a large dog, right? Every person is going to have a very different experience, sensation, um, feeling about being surrounded or in the presence of a dog, right? And so that was the downside, where there's a lot of subjectivity to introspection. The one of the most and the, the greatest advantages or um, contributions that structuralism had was that it influenced the development of experimental psychology. So now we're able to use the technology that we have now to determine what structures are working in conjunction with one another to create that conscious experience, right? So now we're able to see that uh, in real time using the, the technology that we have in the 21st century. Way back when we didn't have that. And so it was a lot more, it was a lot more difficult um, to, identify uh, those different elements and how those elements work together. And now we're able to do that with technology that we have now with, you know, PET scans, we're able to uh, do the imagery of the brain, um, fMRIs, we're able to look at the, the brain. We'll talk about that in chapter three, where we're able to see what structures of the brain um, create and have different functions, right? So I know the occipital lobe is for sight. I know the frontal cortex, the prefrontal cortex is with, for decision making, um, and I know the the um, the amygdala is for fear response, right? I know all those things, and so now I'm able to make those decisions based on the imagery that we have um, with new technology. Okay. The second school of thought. The second school of thought. Um, it was a um, structuralism started it off. And then as individuals and other individuals in the, uh, the psychology uh, field were looking at structuralism, they, they, found some, uh, they found some holes in the theory, 
right? So functionalism was then created simply because, again, with it being so subjective, it's really impossible um, to ask somebody about their experience because, again, you're going to get a different answer each time. So functionalism um, emerged, and it was based on the, the belief that psychology should not just um, investigate the, the structural parts of the conscious experience, so sensation, perception, um, you know, how we feel, the emotions, but it was what is the purpose, what is the function of consciousness and behavior, right? So one of the examples I use is, again, what is the function and the purpose of tears, right? There are several purposes for when we see someone crying, there are a number of reasons why tears and the purpose of tears, right? One of those reasons is maybe they're emotional, they're sad, um, and they're releasing some hormones in their body that help them to feel better. Or maybe I have some dust in my eye or I have something in my eye and tears are being created to remove whatever it is out of my eye, right? Um, but again, those are just different functions and purposes for tears. And so there's a there's similar thing for consciousness. You know, what is the emotion of anxiety? Why um, why are we anxious, right? Um, what is the what is the 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 function of anxiety? What is the function of happiness, right? So Charles Darwin was an evolution evolutionist, and William James is considered the father of American psychology. But through this experience, functionalism was looking at the function and uh, the purpose of the conscious or the consciousness of a human being. Right. The only downside to functionalism, however, is when we talk about um, natural selection, right? Uh, evolutionary uh, evolutionists think that there are certain traits and characteristics and behaviors that survive from generation to generation. And those things that aren't helpful and don't help for survival, those things are then removed and deleted. Right. So functionalism said that, again, as we move, then we have certain uh, behaviors, we have certain trains of thought that then create who we are today. But again, the downside of that is there are things outside of our control that cause us to behave in certain ways. So it's not just the individual. There are other outside forces that might contribute to uh, the way someone thinks, the way someone behaves, uh, and someone's perception. Okay. Um, but again, William James, again, the father of American psychology, he analyzed consciousness into elements, right? But he also argued that it's not just elements, right? It's not just separate elements, that it's a flow. It's a flow. It's just not, uh, you know, the sensation, the feelings, and, you know, your emotions are all separate entities. There's a flow of um, consciousness. And so we call that the stream of consciousness. So it's not just individual components. We can't really break them up and analyze them into elements, but we can um, look at the stream of consciousness to see how it's functioning and uh, its purpose. Okay. Um, one of the advantages and contributions that um, functionalism created was the development of behaviorism and applied psychology. We'll talk about those. Uh, structuralism and functionalism are no longer practiced because again, we have um, different schools of thought that have emerged um, and they have advanced um, structuralism and functionalism. But these two schools of thought were the original. These were the original schools of thought. And these theories obviously have been um, uh, disproven, right? But again, we're moving past that. And this is kind of the, the foundation. These are the foundational schools of thought um, that we know of. Um, for the beginning of psychology, okay? Um, so when we talked about um, structuralism, Wilhelm Wundt, again, a German psychologist, he established the first formal laboratory of psychological research, right? And again, structuralism was, and he helped to emerge experimental psychology. So now we are a science, right? We're just not a philosophy. We're not a soft science, we are a hard science, we have a laboratory, and now we are, again, creating experiments to understand the consciousness of the human experience. You know, what is our behaviors? Um, what are those feelings and emotions? Um, what functions of the parts of the brain influence different uh, emotions and behaviors? 
right? And so eight in 1879, that is considered the birth date uh, for psychology in Europe, in Germany, okay? And so again, there's an establishment of a, the formal laboratory of psychological research in the University of Leipzig, okay? And again, that is the date of birth um, for psychology. Um, Wilhelm Wundt, he established the first journal uh, devoted to publishing research on psychology. And again, he was a structuralist, but eventually used his research to then help to develop other uh, schools of thought, okay? But again, he is widely characterized as the founder of psychology, okay? So structuralism and functionalism talked about the, and focused on the conscious experience. So the things that we can, we can, we can think about, right? We, we feel cold. Um, I know right now that I feel focused and I'm energetic, I'm happy, right? But there was uh, an unconsciousness to the human experience as well. And our thoughts, our memories, and our desires all kind of lie below the surface of our conscious awareness, right? And so uh, Sigmund Freud, which is, a, again, a very, very prominent figure in um, psychology, he looked at what we call the psychoanalytic theory, right? And so what he did was he used kind of talk therapy and he, uh, this all originated with his efforts to treat mental disorders, right? Uh, phobias that we have, obsessions that we have, uh, addictions. And so he was looking at, you know, why does someone have a phobia? Why is someone afraid of dogs? Why would someone be afraid of heights, right? Especially if, you know, there's no reason why they should be. Why do they have an, a, a rational fear for, uh, for a certain uh, situation? Right. So he's looking at their, he's looking at his patients and he's working with his patients to lead them to um, think about what are those thoughts? What are those memories? What are those experiences that they had that are contributing to um, the influence on their behavior? Right. And so he was looking below the surface of our conscious experience and looking to find what that unconscious experience is, is like for an individual. Right. And so he created what we call now the Freudian slip. So. We do this oftentimes when we might be thinking of something, right? And we're thinking of something in the unconscious and we say, right? Um, or we're thinking of something in the unconscious and as we're going to write our name, we write maybe the name of Home Depot because we were thinking about going to Home Depot uh, after leaving campus, right? And again, we do that because of the conscious, the unconscious experiences and influencing uh, our behavior at the conscious level. Okay. But again, he developed the psychoanalytic theory, and all this was is an attempt to explain our personality, uh, the motivation that we have, and any of the mental disorders by focusing on those unconscious determinants of behavior, right? And so we talked about the unconscious, the thoughts, our memories, and our desires. And when you think about um, the psychoanalytic theory, we have to go back, right? We're talking about memories, like what have you experienced? He's also looking at dreams. Like, what are you dreaming? Like, what are your dreams mean? Right. So he's able to, uh, you know, you tell them what your dream is, and they're able to uh, kind of interpret what your dream means. Like, what what are you feeling? Right. And again, those thoughts, those unconscious thoughts, behaviors, and and, and desires all lead to again that that behavior in the conscious. Okay. Another school of thought again, functionalism. Um, was a direct origin of behaviorism, right? We're looking at the purpose. We're looking at the function of uh, the conscious experience. And behaviorism, um, John B. Watson was the individual who kind of founded uh, behaviorism, right? And this theory is based on the premise that, again, when we talk about scientific psychology, it should study only observable behaviors that we can quantify, all right? Those things that we can see, and when you're looking at, again, the unconscious, again, a very, very subjective way of looking at the psychological or the, uh, the mental and, uh, mental experience of a human being, right? So the behaviorist thought that, okay, if we can directly observe it, then we can quantify it, and that is how that's science, right? And a behavior, when we talk about behavior, is any overt response, any activity, right? Um, so they're doing construction, um, outside of Michaela McIntosh on that, that street, 
right that runs you know right in front of the fraternity and sorority road and again you know that changes the behavior of those who park on campus right so we now we can't park on or near that area because again we know uh, that the road is closed right so again our behaviors change based on um, the environment okay john b watson had a view of what we call nature versus nurture debate. And that was the beginning of, you know, does our uh, nature or our biology, our physiology influence our behavior or is it our nurture, right? Or is it our environment, um, the external stimulus in our environment? And so what we've begun um, to understand now is it's both, right? Uh, back then, John B. Watson said that we are not made, meaning we don't, on our, our influence by our environment. Um, uh, it says that we are made, excuse me, that we are more influenced by our environment than we are by the genetics, right? And so we have to be mindful of that. Um, again, this is the very beginning and we're kind of moving out of um, this train of thought because now we know that heredity is really, really important and does influence um, personality and influences behaviors. Uh, it influences a lot of different things that we experience as human beings. Okay. Uh, but again, he maintained that the environment uh, is, and our behavior is governed entirely by the environment. And we now know uh, that we do have some control um, over our behaviors as, as human beings. Okay. Um, B.F. Skinner was a, uh, another proponent of behaviorism, uh, and he questioned free will, right? Uh, he says that we are all controlled by our environment and not by ourselves. So he kind of went in line with John B. Watson. But now we know that, you know, in a way we are influenced and controlled by, our, but we do have some influence, right? We have some control and some autonomy on what we do, how we behave based on our previous experiences, right? But again, there's an internal mental event. Again, can't be studied scientifically, so we have to use those overt behaviors and be able to quantify them. And that's the only way that uh, that we can do science. And that was the premise behind behaviorism. Okay. As we move from um, behaviorism, we move on to the uh, the humanist approach, right? So humanistic approach is. Again, a theoretical orientation that says and emphasizes the quality of humans, right? Especially the freedom we have and our potential for personal growth, right? So the previous um, schools of thought, structuralism, functionalism, um, behaviorism, all of them um, were said to, you know, we don't have much control, especially when we talk about behaviorism, right? The environment is in control and we have no free will. If you're not making any decisions, we're completely controlled by our environment, right? Um, but what the humanistic approach says is we are not just pawns. We are not just controlled by our environment. You know, uh, we can change, right? We can change. We can move. We can make decisions. We have a functioning prefrontal cortex. And so we can make, we can, we have choices. Uh, we do things on our own accord. Right. If you wake up in the morning and you don't feel like going to class, you have free will. Right. Just because class is scheduled doesn't mean you have to go to class. Right. If you don't like your job and you decide you want to walk off your job and quit, you have every right to do that. Again, it may not be beneficial for you, but you have every right to do that. Just because you're scheduled to work doesn't mean you have to go into work. Right. So, again, we have um, control. We have a freedom and we can grow. We, we can we have personal growth. We can mature as we grow. And and the functionalist approach was kind of it, it kind of hit on that, those individual differences. Right. So we're all individuals. We all uh, develop at different levels at different speeds. Right. And so for the humanistic approach, we also again, we move at different speeds. Right. We all grow at different speeds because we have different circumstances that we grow in. And again, genetically, we're just very, very different and unique. OK. Um, humanists believe that because humans are fundamentally different from other animals, research on animals has little relevance to understanding of human behavior, right? So this is true in a sense, right? But physiologically, a lot of the uh, the biology of the human, human being and animals, we have similar um, biologies, right? We have similar 
of bodily organs. Um, our brains are similar in some ways, depending on the animal, right? So if we're looking at primates, you know, their brains are very, very close to ours. And so they think they may not have a language, a auditory language that they use, but they do communicate in ways that, you know, we don't communicate, right? And they don't problem solve the way we do, right? But again, um, there is some relevance um, to using animals to, to do research uh, on, on human beings, okay? Um, the prominent humanists that you'll see here, you see Carl Rogers on the left and uh, Abraham Maslow on the right. Uh, and uh, we'll talk about Abraham Maslow uh, on the next slide, okay? Uh, Abraham Maslow was, uh, he became very, very prominent for creating what we call the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And he studied the positive qualities, right, of human beings. And uh, he created the hierarchy of needs and expressed it in his book, what we call, you see their motivation and personality. Right. Um, there are five different needs that we have as human beings. Right. You have your physiological needs. You have safety. You have long and love and belonging. You have esteem and you have self-actualization. OK. The you see at the bottom here. The physiological needs, that's the foundation. Right. That's the foundation for everyone. Right. You got to have you have to be able to breathe. You have to be able to function. Your body has to be able to function. Um, you're, you need food, you need water. Um, in order to um, reproduce, you have to have sex, you have to have sleep. All of those things are natural things that we do as human beings, and we need those things to, again, remain in homeostasis, right, and equilibrium as a human being, right? If we're off track, then we might not be able to develop and move on to safety, right? So safety, again, you got security of body, so I have clothing, I have shelter, um, you know, I have employment to make money. Um, I have resources. I have morality. So I'm making decisions that are good for me. Right. Um, you know, I wouldn't be in the game because, again, that that's not safe. Right. So I, I stay in places where I know I'm going to be safe. Um, you know, health. So making sure that, you know, you're going to the gym, you're getting proper sleep, you're eating, eating well. All of those things are, are getting to the safety piece. Then you have love and belonging. Right. Friendship, family, sexual intimacy. Right. You have to feel like you belong. You have to feel like you're being you're loved. Right. That in and of itself helps a child or a person uh, be their best self. Love someone the way they need to be loved and you'll see them flourish and grow and, uh, and reach their fullest potential a lot faster than somebody who does not have uh, the support system and the love that uh, we all we all desire as human beings. OK. Then you have self-esteem, confidence, achievement, respect for others, respect by others, right? So we have um, some esteem and, and confidence and motivation that we develop based on, again, the foundation that we see from the physiological to the safety um, to love and belonging. And then the last piece is self-actualization, right? Uh, and it says here, it says, a person's motivation to reach his own full potential. Right. That's your full potential self-actualization. All the other needs must be met before you reach your full potential. Right. So um, I like um, one of my biggest passions is education. And I like to focus in areas, especially impoverished areas or economically disadvantaged areas. And, you know, how can we improve the environment and the school culture for individuals who don't have a lot of these basic needs? Right. A lot of young people um, don't have food or proper clothing. They don't get enough sleep. And so when they get to school, the last thing on their mind is is doing well on their math test or, uh, you know, reading. Right. They're they're tired. They're exhausted. They don't feel safe at home. Uh, many of them have a dysfunctional family. And so, you know, maybe they don't get enough intimacy. Maybe they don't get enough, you know, love and, and support. Right. So we have to make sure that our young people are getting these bases so that they are able to, to achieve their fullest potential, right? And a lot, very, very, it's very, very rare, right, for uh, a good percentage of people to reach self-actualization because again, oftentimes we're missing one of these pieces, right? But again, it's possible. We just have to make sure and be intentional about creating the opportunity for uh, us to meet these needs, okay? Uh, here is the different perspectives 
and uh, the kind of their influential period. Um, you'll see also in the uh, second column, you see the principal contributors to uh, these approaches. Uh, you also have the subject matter, kind of what they talk about, what they what they study, and then kind of the basic premise, right? So if you need kind of a, an overview of the different um, perspectives, then this is where you'll see it. Okay. Um, as we talk about um, psychology, um, as you saw, um, many of the uh, the prominent figures in psychology were uh, cisgender white men, right? Um, there was a there, there wasn't much representation um, for women or African Americans in psychology uh, at the beginning, right? And so we're still struggling um, to get representation, um, especially for uh, minority groups. But women are have dominated and and, have, and continue to dominate the field of psychology. Again, even with um, many of the uh, the the keys. Uh, to what what psychology was again were created and founded by white men, right? Uh, but Mary Whitten Calkins was um, very very uh, instrumental. Margaret Floyd Washburn also extremely in instrumental in um, again breaking the barrier and breaking through um, the barrier to uh, into psychology. Um, uh, Mary Whitkin, Whit, uh, Whitten Calkins um, she studied under William James, and if you recall William James. Uh, was uh, the found, found, founding father of functionalism, functionalism, right? So she became the first woman to serve as the president of the American Psychological Association. Um, she never, um, never received her PhD in psychology from Harvard because they did not honor the classes she had taken, right? So she was discriminated against. Um, they, they, you know, sexism, right? So she took cl classes as a guest student at Harvard, but they did not recognize uh, the classes that she took because she was a guest, right? But she did serve as president of the uh, American Psychological Association. Okay, she also, um, when the functionalist party and the structuralist parties um, were kind of what we call beefing, you know, they were going back and forth and and at odds with one another. She wrote an article and talked about how there were some commonalities in both of those schools of thought, both of those perspectives. And one of those common the, the commonality was they both looked at the consciousness of the human experience. Right. But even with that, there still was, you know, turmoil and strife and and, and you know, uh, beef, <laughs> like we like to say, um, that they experienced. OK. Um, Margaret Floyd Washburn. OK. She was the ex very first woman uh, to receive her Ph.D. in psychology. And she became the second woman um, to serve as president of the American Psychological Association. Right. Um, she experienced a similar issue. Uh, when she was attending Columbia University, because uh, Columbia University was not very hospitable toward women, but she was eventually able to earn her doctorate in 1894 um, from Cornell, Cornell University. That's the university I attended uh, for undergrad. Uh, one of the biggest things that uh, Cornell is, is founded on, um, uh, Ezra Cornell said that he found an institution where any person can find instruction in any study. Right. So they, we were very, very inclusive at the very beginning. And so that's how um, Dr. Washburn was able to receive her Ph.D. Um, because, again, very, very and a lot more inclusive university allowed her to study. Okay. Again, during this time, um, you know, especially in the, the 19th century, it was very, very difficult for uh, black psychologists to break through. Right. If women were having issues then you know that men, especially black men and black women were having issues uh, breaking into psychology. And uh, Francis Cecil Sumner is known as the father of black psychology, right? He, he was the first African-American to receive a PhD in psychology in 1920, right? And just look at the difference in time, right? Um, while women, they had some, some you know, some, some issues, black, black men and women had even bigger barriers um, than, than women did, white women did, right? So Sumner's main focus was in, in race psychology, right? What are the disparities that we see and what are the racial biases um, that we see in, in schools and jobs, right? And then how can we eliminate those racial bias in the administrative 
administration of justice, right? So he was big on studying the effects of uh, the racial discrimination and racial bias on individuals in um, different settings, especially in the school setting, right? So he wanted to kind of just combat the Eurocentric methods of psychology that were used during his time, right? Because a lot of the studies, um, when we talk about, you know, emotions and feelings and perceptions and, um, you know, the conscious experience is very different for a black person than it is for a white person, right? And a lot of the studies were done on white men and women. No black women, no black men and women. So a lot of the results that these studies were getting, they were biased, right? Um, that That's not our experience. And so now that we have black psychologists, it's really important that we uh, we do studies and we do experiments on um, our people so that our representation is seen um, in the research. Okay. Um, knowledge check, who established the first psychology research laboratory? You can pause it, um, but the answer is Wilhelm Wundt. Again, in 1879, he established the first formal laboratory for research in psychology um, at the University of Leipzig. Okay. So, psychology's modern history. Okay. So, when we talk about psychology, um, initially it was really just theory, right? Um, we did begin to do research and we were able to do some experiments to understand uh, the function and, uh, you know, the purpose of, uh, you know, behavior and our consciousness. But clinical psychology was the first branch of psychology that gained prominence. And it was the first applied arm of psychology to achieve that prominence. And one of the reasons it achieved prominence was because uh, we were called upon um, in World War II to address some of the issues that we were experiencing um, from soldiers, right? So when we talk about clinical psychology, it's concerned with diagnosis and treatment of uh, psychological problems and mental disorders, right? So one of the biggest uh, parts of clinical psychology during that time, during the wartime, was we need to be able to screen military recruits to see if they're going to be fit for, uh, for war or battles, and we also need to treat those who suffer from trauma, okay? One of the biggest things that emerged from um, World War II um, was that we began to start to see the, what we call shell shock or post-traumatic stress disorder. And it was creating other mental disorders uh, when soldiers were returning home. And so clinical psychologists were able to work with um, other physicians, psychiatrists to make um, the uh, transition from wartime back to civilian life a little easier uh, based on um, training and, uh, and diagnosis, okay? But again, clinical psychology is a very, very popular field, very, um, uh, very competitive. Um, you, make a, you make a lot more money than some other psychologists, but again, it was the very first uh, prominent psychological field of study, okay? Uh, today, um, as we look at the profession of psychology, um, um, there's an umbrella of what we call a, applied psychology, and it covers a variety of different professional specialties. Uh, it includes um, clinical psychology, counseling psychology, school psychology, and one of the uh, the most prominent now uh, is the emerging field of psychology is industrial uh, organizational psychology. Okay, and again, all of these have different. Um, they have this a very very similar. Um, Again, it's, it's using psychology in different sectors, in different circumstances, different situations, right? Uh, so again, clinical psychology is treating individuals with psychological disorders. Counseling psychologists, they assist people with their everyday problems. So you might have an individual who um, is struggling with addiction. You might have some marriage counselor. Um, you might have a family counselor. Uh, school counselors, they promote positive development in school children, right? So if a child is you know, experiencing an issue in school, uh, maybe they're having trouble focusing. They might be tested uh, for um, ADHD, ADD, um, and they create an environment um, and resources and support for children that might need help. Okay. Um, one of the other fields of psychology, industrial organizational. Now, this one is you know human resources. Um, improve your job satisfaction, your productivity, and just look at the overall uh, organization. You know, is it inclusive? Um, 
are the individuals in your organization a good fit for your organization, right? So engineers might do better in, um, you know, in a STEM field, maybe in engineering, like, you know, developing a bridge or, you know, aerospace, right? But they might not be that great in, um, as a kindergarten teacher, right? Uh, so again, industrial organizational psychologists are looking at the individual and then seeing if they're a good fit for whatever sector they're, uh, they're applying to. Okay. Uh, one of the biggest things um, that is kind of reemerging now, um, there's a renewed interest in cognition and physiology. If you remember um, at the very beginning, um, physiology was, um, it, it, it started off as again, philosophy and physiology at the beginning, right? And so now we have psychology. So now we're looking at physiology, we're looking at human behavior, and we're looking at our cognition and how cognition uh, is, again, related to physiology, right? So we're looking at coordination, we're looking at our control, our thinking, our senses, we're looking at our memory, right? So we're looking at the mental processes that involved in acquiring knowledge. All of those things are kind of returning um, to a renewed uh, sense of, again, what is cognition and what is physiology and how those things are related, right? So as you look and see, right, over the years, uh, these are articles that were written um, with keywords, right? So over in the 1950s, the cognitive approach had kind of lost its, uh, lost its momentum, right? Um, and uh, if you look at the behavioral approach, you look at the uh, neuroscience and the green, and then you see the psychoanalytic approach, right? Psychoanalytic approach has not gained much popularity, but as you can tell, cognitive approach has gained a lot of pop popularity and neuroscience is also gaining a lot of popularity, right? So those are cognition, cognitive psychology, um, neuroscience, uh, industrial organizational psychology, all of those are really, really three popular emerging fields of psychology. If you're interested in psychology, those are some fields of psychology that are booming right now. Um, sports psychology is another one. Um, these are booming um, fields of psychology at the moment. Okay. Um, so again, we talked about that at the beginning, right? So at the beginning, we looked at who was founding uh, a lot of perspectives, right? White men, right? But women were able to break the barrier uh, black men and women were able to break, break the barrier e eventually, right? But we're still underrepresented um, in psychology, right? So there are two trends um, that are being promoted right now, right? The Western psycho psychologists are broadening their horizons, right? So not just looking at the American experience, we need to look at um, the Latino experience. We need to look at the uh, Chinese experience, the uh, Korean experience, uh, the Middle Eastern experience. Uh, the American Indian experience, right? Um, the indigenous person's experiences as well to see how psychology varies based on and how cognition, feelings, our emotions, our perceptions vary based on um, where we live in our culture, okay? Um, again, ethnic makeup of the Western world has become increasingly diverse, right? So we need a multicultural uh, perspective when we look at and do uh, psychological research, right? So again, when we talk about um, psychology, white men and women, they aren't um, and they shouldn't be the foundation, right? We should be using a diverse perspective and have a diverse perspective on the way uh, psychology is applied to um, different groups, um, different multi multicultural groups. Um, one of the other things that we've uh, talked about um, over the course of um, the emergence of evolutionary psychology, right? Um, evolutionary psychology is a perspective that examines the behavior and processes in terms of how they adapt over the course of many generations, right? So um, we'll talk about this, but when we talk about anxiety, if I were, say I were in the Stone Age, right? Um, anxiety was important then and it's still important now, specifically because it's a survival mechanism, right? When we talk about our amygdala and how our amygdala has this fight or flight response, 
right? We have a fight or flight response because it's a survival mechanism, right? If we see something that is dangerous, we run, right? If we can't run, then we fight, right? Because the anxiety in our body, it again, it creates this physiological, um, these physiological changes in our body, and it it primes us to either run or fight. Right. And so evolutionary says that there are certain things, um, behavioral processes, uh, trains of thought that are. They just they, they go and move and and kind of go from generation to generation. Right. Um, just based on their adaptiveness. Right. We're able to survive their survival mechanism. And so they move and survive from generation to generation. OK. Um, evolutionary psychologists assert that patterns of behavior seen in a species are products of evolution in the same way that anatomical characteristics are, right? So, you know, the melanin that we have in our skin was a anatomical characteristic, it's kind of a uh, physiological characteristics, and we, we, we needed the melanin in our skin because we grew up and we were in warmer climates, right, that had a lot of sun, right? And so... With more melanin, we didn't get as burned and we didn't experience some of the uh, the major issues with the sun, right? So, and again, that's why we have melanin. And again, over the course of time, that's how we evolved, okay? Um, us being able to sweat, right? So, us being able to sweat, us being able to run long distances, right? So, when we're hunting and we need to run a long distance, we run, we run, we run, we run. If we're hunting down, say we're hunting a bison, right? The bison can run for a, a short amount of time, right? After they run, they get tired. They can't perspire. They can't. They can't run. They don't. They're not running upright, right? We can perspire. We can breathe um, through our, in, in through our nose, out through our mouth, and that's how we're able to catch them. We, we run longer distances because we can perspire. We don't get hot or overheat. Um, when a bison or an animal overheats, they're done, right? So we we chase them for a couple, several miles. They get tired, they overheat, then we're able to kill them for food, right? So again, that evolutionary uh, period, right? We're able to look at those behaviors. We're able to look at, um, uh, again, perspectives, feelings, emotions, and how they evolved over time, okay? Um, psychology is also moved and will, be, and will be called a positive direction, right? So we don't, in the past, we've looked at the deficits of people, right? We're looking at, you know, uh, mental disorders or uh, stress, bad stress, right? We're looking at, you know, what things go wrong, right? But when we talked about the humanistic perspective, that was more a, of a positive perspective. Right. We have the potential for personal growth. We have the potential to uh, experience happiness and love and gratitude. Right. We we have positive personal per personality traits. Right. So, you know, maybe we're more conscientious and we're more outgoing and we are. You know, we're, we're less uh, extroverted and more, you know, or more extroverted and more of a people person. We're altruistic. Right. So those are all positive characteristics, right? So three areas of interest when we talk about positive psychology, uh, you have, the, again, the positive sub subjective experience. So we're talking about those emotions. Um, you have positive individual traits, so integrity, kindness, perseverance. And again, how do these characteristics and these personal strengths, how do they influence our life, right? Do they improve the outcome and the, the outcomes for people or do they not, right? So we're studying how they influence uh, the life, the lived outcomes for people, and then positive institutions and communities, right? Strong families, healthful working environments, supportive neighborhoods and communities, right? In the past, again, we're looking at the deficits. We're looking at, you know, what happens when, um, you know, you have a divorced, a single mother raising a son, right? That's I grew up in that situation, right? So we looked at the deficits. What happens, right? What are the outcomes for those who? Uh, grow up in individuals who are grow up in dysfunctional families, right? So again, uh, we're moving to a more positive look on psychology. Okay. Um, again, psychology is becoming more and more diversified um, as we move. Um, more subfields of psychology are, are emerging, right? 
Uh, the last li list I looked at, um, there were over like a hundred plus uh, subfields of psychology, right? Uh, I'm a community psychologist. Uh, you have sports psychology, you have educational psychology, child psychology, you name it, forensic psychology. Um, there are so many different subfields of psychology. There is a commonality in um, the subject matter, right? But that subject matter is then applied to uh, different dimensions um, and, and different uh, divisions of, uh, of, you know, our world, right? But again, when we talk about psychology, um, psychology, you're studying behavior. We're studying the psychological and the cognitive processes that underlie that behavior. And then you're also looking at how the cognition and the behavior are connected, right? But again, contemporary psychology, very, very popular uh, and thriving science and profession, right? Um, you can get a, a psychology degree and you can go into pretty much any field of study because there is a, a lot of overlap, um, a lot of overlap um, and interdisciplinary um, overlap between various fields, right? Um, so um, at Alabama a &M, we're one of the largest uh, majors uh, we have like 350 students um, in our major. Um, and again, one of the largest, because when you go into psychology, you can go into just about anything. Uh, you can get a master's, uh, you can get a, a bachelor's in psychology and then get a master's in business. Um, you know, I have a bachelor's in economics and a master's in business, and, and I have a, a master's in psychology and a PhD in psychology, right? So it's very uh, interdisciplinary, right? And very multifaceted. Um, here are some of the subfields and some of the basic questions um, about behavior that they address. Um, so when you're looking at how do our social networks affect behavior, um, you're looking at social psychology, you're looking at community psychology, um, you know, applied social psychology. Uh, how do people sense, perceive, learn, and think about the world? Um, you're looking at cognitive psychology, you're looking at, um, you know, perceptual psychology, you're just looking at various psychologies, right? What are the sources of change and stability in uh, behavior across a lifespan? That's, uh, you know, developmental psychology. So looking at, you know, how people change over the course of time. And then the psychological factors that affect uh, the physical and mental health, right? So uh, physiological psychology. So looking at, you know, what are those factors, right? Does our mood, does our depression, mental disorders, do they affect us? Um, you know, again, how does that affect our, our uh, physical and mental health? Okay. Uh, here are just some different places of employment. Um, the greatest majority, uh, you'll see private practice. Uh, you'll see individuals in, at colleges and universities as, as, uh, uh, as professors or administrators. Um, you'll see them in schools. Uh, you'll, again, you'll see them at the private industry. Um, I've worked in private industry. I've worked in nonprofits. Uh, I've worked in um, the school setting. I've worked um, in businesses and the government as well. Um, so again, you can go and do just about anything uh, with a psychology degree. Okay. And again, obviously, uh, hospitals and clinics uh, we were founded. Um, the first applied psycho psychological field was clinical psychology. And so we were in the hospitals. We were in clinics. Uh, and helping to diagnose issues that uh, the soldiers were having during World War II. Uh, just some other areas of research um, and contemporary psychology that are studied. Uh, very diverse, very even across the board. You got developmental, you got social, uh, health, health um, research, uh, physiological research, experimental research, um, psychometrics. Um, all of these are different areas of uh, contemporary research that we do in psychology. Um, specialties in psychology, right? Um, so there is a, a distinction that should be drawn um, for psychiatry and clinical psychology. Um, so psychiatry is a branch of medicine and psychology is just a subfield of psychology. Uh, psychiatrists um, they are involved in diagnosing and treating psychological disorders and problems. And however, they do it in a medical sense, right? So they're able to prescribe medicine, 
um, to help to treat um, such psychological disorders and problems, right? Usually with a clinical psychologist, they diagnose and treat psych psychological disorders using um, different therapies and techniques uh, that they've learned um, during their, their training, um, their psychological training, right? So again, psychiatrists, they spend a little more time in school than do clinical psychologists. They essentially do the same thing, but in a different way, right? Mm -hmm. Usually, uh, again, medicine is involved with psychiatrists and with clinical psychology, they don't like, I'm not saying they don't like, if they have to uh, prescribe medicine, they have to use, utilize a psychiatrist to prescribe medicine to someone that they diagnosed uh, with a psych psychological problem or disorder. Okay. Uh, here are some of those psychology, psychology subfields. Like I talked about, they are numerous. Um, this is just a, a very, very short list, um, but the lit, there's a more exhaustive list that has upwards of 100 different subfields of psychology. Um, again, you can go into almost any uh, different subfield um, depending on what your interest is. Again, I am a, uh, a community psychology, and uh, and but I, I work in various uh, different subfields. I love sports psychology, love educational psychology, um, uh, experimental psychology. Um, so those are other areas that I've worked in um, as well. Okay. Um, so again, we looked at the field of psychology, um, you know, the different subfields. We've looked at, um, you know, where you could go, what kind of uh, research is being done, what kind of jobs you might be able to get um, in different sectors. But again, here's a portrait of what's going on in psychology as far as the demographics. Uh, so as of 2010, and I need to update this, um, women uh, continue to outnumber men in the field. Uh, so 64.8% uh, or 65% of all psychologists are women. And uh, again, 35.2% are men, right? So there's an they outnumber uh, us in the field. Um, for men. Um, the vast majority of psychologists in the United States are white, and the most common ethnicity of uh, psychologists, you have 79% white, almost 80%. You have 10% uh, Hispanic Latino. Um, you got Black or African American at 5%, and then about 4% um, Asian, right? So again, when we're talking about representation, it's important that uh, Black psychologists are getting through undergrad going to get their master's degree and practice in psychology um, and whatever field they decide to practice, okay? 18% um, uh, are members of the racial minority groups. So again, there, there's a limited diversity in the field of psychology in the current moment, right? Uh, as you can see, especially for Black and African Americans, we only make up 5% of all of the Black psychologists. And, uh, and then you look at the, the amount of men. So the amount of men in psychology is even less, right? So that's why I decided to go into psychology. I, I love the field of psychology, uh, but I want to be a, a representation and represent um, for Black psychologists in the United States. Okay. Um, when you look at the disparities in PhDs, there is there are some disparities, right? Depending on what field of psychology uh, you're in, right? So in developmental psychology. Um, women outnumber men in developmental psychology. A lot of the psycho psychology fields, um, as you, um, so family, uh, clinical counseling, all of these are, I'm, I'm not going to say softer, but men are not usually associated with, you know, developmental psychology because, you know, there is it's a, a bias that men, you know, are a little more, um, if they just don't, they're not a little less nurturing or, you know, it's kind of some sub bias there, right? But you do see um, that some men are getting those degrees. And as you move down, uh, you got social and personality, uh, industrial, organizational, general psychology, cognitive psychology. So as you uh, move down the list, you do see more and more PhDs, uh, more evenly distributed uh, among men and women. Okay. There is a disparity, however, in uh, 
at the graduate psychology departments, right? So when we're talking about doctoral faculty, uh, full-time doctoral faculty, right? So um, as you go from lecturer to full professor, the uh, salary increases as you go down, right? So there is a, an income gap, an income disparity. Um, though uh, more men, more women are dominating the field, men are still earning more than women in the field. And so that's an issue as well. So we need to, again, level that playing field for men and women in the field of psychology, right? So um, again, lecturers may, um, I'll, I think I'll, I'll look those, those, those values up. But again, as you move down, um, I think at the university, um, Lecturers make like, it really depends. Um, usually as a lecturer, you know, you're not making but maybe $40,000 a year. Assistant professors uh, make about, on average, they make about $70,000 a year. Um, associate professors on average make about, I think $90,000 a year. And then as a full professor, you're gonna make upwards of 110 to $120,000 a year. Right. So you see that men are outnumbering women um, and there's a disproportionate um, amount of men who, again, have full professors or are for full, full professors than women. Okay. Uh, and this will be the last thing I'll talk about, the seven unifying themes. So as we go through the textbook, what you'll understand and realize is that there are several themes that kind of unify psychology. And the number one theme is that psychology is empirical, right? So empirical empiricism, again, this is the knowledge that should be acquired through observation, right? So um, we do experiments, we observe, and that's how we are able to make uh, make the theories and, and make, improve some of the things that we've proven um, in, in the human experience, okay? Um, psychology is theoretically diverse, right? So you'll see that, again, out of all of those various subfields of psychology, those are various theories that are um, related to each of those theories or each of those subfields, right? So all of those interrelated ideas help to explain the observations that we make um, as psychologists. Um, psychology evolves in a socio-historical context, right? So the problems that our, um, our ancestors faced, um, especially with feelings and emotions and uh, perceptions are very different, right? Society and history impacts our psychology and what's being studied, All right? So right now, um, when, we when we look at the, the Me Too movement, when we look at uh, police brutality and, and its effects on uh, the black community, psychological and physiological, right? Those are some key areas. Um, again, society and history are changing, right? Uh, when we look at, you know, in the environment, how the environment is influencing um, the, the physiological and psychological uh, outlook on, on people. Again, those are uh, the social historical context that we're talking about. Um, behavior is determined by multiple causes, right? So there are various, there's nature, there's nurture, the environment, our past experiences, all of those different causes um, help to determine what our behavior is, okay? Uh, behavior is shaped by cultural heritage, right? So our culture, as as you know, many of us are black men and women, right? So our culture, uh, the culture is our shared customs, beliefs, values, norms, institutions, and other products of community, right? Our cultural heritage shapes our behavior, right? So you know, our behaviors are going to be very different than someone who grew up in a in a white community versus a black community versus someone who grew up in um, in Eastern Europe. Right. So, again, our cultural heritage influences our behavior, heredity and environment um, or nature and nurture jointly influence behavior. And then the last thing is people's experience of the world is subjective. And that goes without saying um, we're all unique. And, uh, you know, if I ask everyone in the classroom how you're feeling in a particular moment, everyone is going to have a very, very different uh, answer. Um, if I ask you, what, what emotion are you feeling at the current moment, right? Some people might be feeling sad, others happy, others encouraged, others frustrated, right? So everyone might be feeling a different um, experience right? and have, and have, a, have a different different experience based on, you know, what they're experiencing in the world at that time, right? So it's very subjective. Um, 
And so that is our last thing. Okay. And here are just uh, the themes listed out in a uh, in a different format. Okay. So it says Miguel is a graduate student studying the diagnosis and treatment of psychological problems and disorders. It says which branch of psychology is this? Clinical psychology, developmental psychology, social psychology, or school psychology, right? If you remember, when we talked about um, psychiatry and clinical psychology, both of those uh, fields of psychology diagnose and treat um, psychological problems and disorders. So the answer to this question is A. Okay. I think I'll stop there. Um, I'll cover, um, I want to cover time management, um, but I'm kind of running out of time. So I'll go ahead and, and stop here. But uh, again, this is chapter one. Um, that's the end of chapter one. Uh, I will cover time management. Uh, maybe I'll cover that tomorrow um, during lecture in class. But, uh, but again, be mindful. Uh, again, this will be posted um, on our Blackboard. Make sure, make sure you're going through, uh, going through your the textbook, also going through the lecture slides, and going back through uh, the lecture. Okay. If you have any questions, I'm available. Uh, email me. Um, but until the next time, we'll see you later.